Yeah, I'm all set up. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to thank the same and the organizers again for the invitation to attend this winter school. I've been learning a lot. Um, you guys put forward a challenge to me yesterday on the bus ride. So here's my haiku. <laughs> All right, so I'm at Columbia University. As I said earlier, I'm also with the American Astronomical Society. If any of the students have questions about preparing manuscripts, submitting manuscripts, the refereeing process, please ask me. Uh, the work I'm showing today is supported by the National Science Foundation and by NASA. Here's an outline of what I'm going to be talking about it doesn't show up very well here. I apologize. Okay. Uh, I'll start by talking. I'm talking about the modern universe today. So I'm talking about gas that's been cycled through population one and population two stars. Sorry, population three and population two stars. Um, so I'll start by talking about diffuse clouds, which are gravitationally held together and can. Uh, some of them can go on to form stars. Uh, those that do condense become dense clouds where they're now fully molecular. Uh, inside dense clouds, there are cores that start to gravitationally collapse, giving us pre stellar cores. Uh, stars will form, and the material that's left over forms a protoplanetary disk. And then eventually, the star blows away the excess material in the disk, and we're left with the star and the planets forming the star. And I'll talk about laboratory astrochemistry studies relevant to almost all cycles, epics, and the cycle of gas. So let me start with diffuse clouds. This is an image on the sky of a diffuse cloud. It's being plotted in terms of declination and right ascension. Uh, what's being plotted is the neutral hydrogen column density, so that's atomic hydrogen or spectroscopic notation is H1. Uh, and this is basically number density integrated along line of sight. So it has units of one over area. And the, this is the color bar here to read the figure. These red regions are diffuse clouds, and here's Here's the scale. These are about 20 light years in size. So I talked on uh, Tuesday about proto galaxies, which were like 20,000 light years. Now we're at like 20 light years. Um, and chemistry can play an important role in the evolution of these clouds. Chemistry, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, maybe a few other elements, but I'm going to focus on the most abundant elements. So the density of these clouds, as you've heard numerous times, is on the order of 10 to 100 particles per cubic centimeter. That means that only binary reactions drive the chemistry. The density is not high enough in three-body collisions. It also means that the mean collision time is far longer than the radiative lifetimes of these systems, of these molecules. So local thermodynamic equilibrium does not hold. The gas temperature of diffuse clouds is like 50 to 100 Kelvin. Most neutral, neutral chemical reactions have an activation barrier that needs to be overcome. At 50 to 100 Kelvin, there's not enough translational energy for the colliders to overcome that barrier. So most of the chemistry is driven by ion neutral chemistry. That's not totally true. There are some neutral, neutral reactions that have been discovered to be important, but the the vast majority of the gas phase chemistry is driven by ion neutral reactions. So one of the questions is what ionizes the gas and initiates the chemistry? And John and others have talked about this earlier. Naively, we would think that it's ultraviolet light from stars that ionize the gas. But the abundant atomic hydrogen in the interstellar medium is going to absorb all of the photons with greater than 13.6 K uh, electron volts. So it's not stars, unless you're talking about something like carbon, which has an ionization potential like 10.6 eV. 
So there are photons that can ionize carbon. So most of the carbon, neutral carbon, is thought to be in the form of carbon plus because of the interstellar radiation field. But the oxygen has an ionization potential higher than 13.6 keV, so it's neutral. So what does the ionization are relativistic particles, cosmic rays, that are believed to be accelerated in supernovae and other energetic events? So how do we determine the cosmic ionization rate? Well, why, why is it important? And I'll explain one of the ways that we determine it. So it drives the chemistry. Chemistry affects the cooling. It also determines the ionization fraction of the cloud. And that couples the physical dynamics of the cloud to the ambient magnetic field. The ions interact with the magnetic field, and you can get momentum transfer and such. And the ions can then collide with the neutral gas, thereby transferring the effects of the magnetic field to the neutral gas. And that can affect the transfer of annual momentum, dissipation of turbulence, and it can impede the collapse of the cloud. So, here's one of the ways that we determine the cosmic ray ionization rate. The formation process of, oh sorry, this is chemistry. We're using OH plus. So we use chemistry to determine the cosmic ray ionization rate. You can also do it with H3 plus, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. Uh, so cosmic ray hits a hydrogen atom, ionizes it, loses an insignificant amount of energy, you have a proton and an electron. That proton will undergo charge exchange with a neutral oxygen atom, giving us O+. The O+, will then rapidly undergo hydrogen abstraction with an H2 <coughs> molecule, giving us OH+. The cosmic ionization rate is very slow. The second step in this reaction is nearly resonant, so that goes relatively fast, so we can ignore it for the moment. The third step in this process, the hydrogen extraction, goes at a fast rate coefficient, so again, we can ignore it. And the formation rate is really limited by the cosmic granization rate times the number density of hydrogen. I have left a number of steps out to try to simplify the chemistry and just give you folks the basic idea. Um, as far as destruction goes, the dominant destruction mechanism are electrons recombining with the OH plus and the energy that's released in this recombination process goes into dissociating the molecule. That's called dissociative recombination. And it has a rate that's proportional to the rate coefficient for dr, the number density of electrons, and OH+. Again, I have simplified the chemistry, just the chemical network here, just to emphasize the certain key chemical reactions. So these clouds evolve very slowly. We can assume quasi-steady state. And we can balance the formation and destruction rate. When we do that, we get this simple formula here. So the cosmic ionization rate is proportional to the number densities of electrons, OH plus, and hydrogen. We get that information from observations. And it's also proportional to the rate coefficient for dissociative recombination. And that's where the chemistry comes in. How well do we know this process? So there are a number of challenges to generating reliable kinetics data for DR. It's a multi-electron system, and so quantum mechanical calculations are theoretically, are computationally challenging, and approximations need to be made in order to make the calculations tractable. How valid are those approximations? Experimentally, when we generate OH+, it's generated in a gas discharge source. If you have enough energy to ionize and make OH+, then the OH plus is going to be vibrationally and rotationally excited with internal temperatures of several thousand Kelvin. That's much different from diffuse cloud temperatures. So the challenge is how do we experimentally 
How do we generate cold OH plus and interact it with a beam of electrons? And this is a uh, construction picture of the cryogenic storage ring at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. It's uh, ions are injected here. Did I miss something? All right. Looks like it's fine. Ions are injected in here uh, at energies of 20 to 300 kV. This is where we merge a beam of electrons so they co-propagate. They're fast cars on a highway. The relative velocity can be made very slow. And we can get to collision energies that correspond to temperatures as low as 10 Kelvin. So this is perfect for astrochemistry. Uh, <clears throat> at the end of the interaction region, any electrons that have neutralized an OH plus forms two neutral particles. The neutral particles continue ballistically onto a detector. And this was supposed to come up first. So the circumference of this cryogenic storage ring is 35 meters. They can cool this down to temperatures of 2 Kelvin. It's multiple vacuum chambers, and the innermost vacuum chamber can be cooled down to 2 Kelvin. You folks may remember from your introductory physics class that when things get cold, they shrink. This 35 meter ring shrinks by something on the order of 10 centimeters. All of the ion optics have been designed to maintain their exact position as the ring shrinks around them. It's an engineering marvel. It's a helium closed cycle refrigeration system that they use. So the ring temperature, 10 Kelvin, is what they can do easily. At such low, low temperatures, the chambers of the Vacuum walls become the vacuum walls become cryo pumps. They pump resi the residual gas molecules. They can get to densities on the order of a thousand particles per second. Per I need more coffee. <laughs> so when you only have a thousand particles per cubic centimeter, the collision between the stored particles and the residual gas is very infrequent. And these ions can be stored for times up to a thousand seconds. That gives any ion that has a dipole moment time to come into radiative equilibrium with the black body of the chamber walls. And so the ions can cool down to temperatures on the order of 10 Kelvin, which is exactly what we need for astronauts. So, um, this is a picture of the ring a couple of years ago. <clears throat> you can see that the uh, chamber has not been closed. Uh, this is, the ions are injected here. This is where the electron beam has been installed. It was installed, obviously, after this picture was taken. And um, these are the people I'm collaborating with. On this, I think it's always really important to talk about the collaborators. Uh, Andreas Wolf and I have been collaborating on for a long time. My former postdoc and now staff scientist at Max Planck Institute, Holden Devotny. Patrick Gillum is a graduate student who's just finished off. Abel Kaloshi is a grad student who's now a postdoc of mine. Daniel Powell is a grad student, and Sunny Sarab is a recently graduated PhD who's moving on to another position. So those are the team members working on the project. I haven't showed all the engineers necessary in order to make this thing work. This is at a Max Planck Institute. There's a huge technical staff in order to support this. There's no way you could do something like this at a university. Yes? How do you bend the beam of electrons without also affecting Yes, that's a major challenge. So the electrons are bent magnetically, but the, there are compensating electric fields to correct the ion trajectory 
for that. So that is the, the ions are get curved. The ions are corrected just before they go through that magnetic coil. So when they come out, they're overlapping with the electron. And um, now for the bait and switch. We just got funding to do this work. I don't have any experimental results from this portion of the talk to present. Uh, so hopefully when you guys see me at a future meeting, we're actually going to have a data run in April, so we should have data this year, next month. Um, before I move on to dense clouds, any questions about this first part? Yes, I have a question about the cosmic rays. You said when they ionize the hydrogen, they really say it's insignificant amount of energy. How long can they propagate? Or what is their time, basically, before they run out of energy? So, these are MeV particles, and each hydrogen atom causes them to lose 13.6 eV. So you can do a back of the envelope calculation about how many orders of magnitude there is. So it really depends on the, the column density and the size of the cloud. Um, that's my way of saying I don't know the answer to the top. <laughs> is there like a Obviously, they participate in other reactions and processes. Is there like a an estimated like time of the average cosmic ray? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. John, do you have any idea about that? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the the answer is a little bit complicated. Sure. It, it's very ener energy dependent. Uh, there are there's a whole area of physics <coughs> devoted to cosmic rays. So. Um, to make a long story short, there are propagation models that uh, describe very well the number of things that can be constrained by observation of cosmic rays. Um, because there, as you say, there are other processes that occur as the cosmic rays travel around the Milky Way. Um, by cosmic ray standards, MEV particles are actually very low energy. And uh, so it's, it's not just the, uh, the stopping that is the sequential energy loss as they interact with hydrogen through a column of gas. That's one of the limits on an MEV particle. But the other thing is the uh, cyclotron uh, uh, emission. Uh, the, the, uh, the cosmic rays uh, uh, spiral yeah, around in the galactic magnetic field, and especially at MEV energies, the uh, magnetic field constraints how far they can actually travel in terms of, of, of physical length from their supernova source, if you will, or from the uh, energy loss of higher energy particles, the both of them. Uh, so those are some of the complications. The stopping length for an MEV particle is about 10 to the 23 hydrogens per square centimeter, I think. So um, in, in typical, even dense dark molecular clouds, they don't lose all of their energy passing through. Did you have a question? Well, actually, yeah, a, a, a comment uh, about the chemistry that you illustrated for the uh, yeah, OH plus. Obviously, you wanted to uh, stress the dissociative recombinations, the crucial reaction where the rate needs to be done because you have this yes. the excitement of this beautiful experiment yeah. coming up. But I wanted to call attention to the, the charge transfer, the H plus plus O, because uh, in fact, going that direction for oxygen atoms in the lowest sublevel of the ground charge, yeah. in fact, is exogergic, uh, sorry, endogergic That's by about 220 kelvin. Yeah. And to make matters worse, right, well, that, that means like temperatures of 100 Kelvin, it will go fairly fast. Yeah, right, it might go fairly fast, but at 30 Kelvin, there's a big temp yeah. Yeah. temperature exponent. Yeah. But the other thing is, uh, and I hope someone might listen to this, uh, the, um, there, there are two quantum mechanical treatments of this charge transfer process in the relatively recent literature that is the last 10 or 15 years or so. Yeah. 
the one I looked like the old stencil, which was a, a nice calculation. However, his result disagrees with a more recent one. And well, you could say it the other way around. Yes. But I, I talked to Philip about this, and he's, he thought, well, he had some ideas of when he needed to go back and recheck. Yeah. Uh, uh, but there's a possibility that the, the details of the interaction potential were not quite uh, adequate for the, the treatment of the problem. So that rate is, uh, to make a long story short, in fact, uncertain. And that's the, especially the, the Yeah. And one of the interesting things, I don't know how much you folks have been following the cold atom and cold molecule work all of that's been going on, BECs and those sorts of things. Uh, they've developed techniques where they can generate neutral atomic oxygen atoms in the triplet P2 level. And so the exciting thing about that development is trying to melt that technique, which is not easy, onto a beam of hydrogen atoms, or sorry, protons, with a beam of protons, and then measure the electron capture or charge transfer cross-section. <clears throat> and I've been talking with colleagues who are leading uh, the field in terms of generating the oxygen. And it's my hope that sometime in the next decade we'll be able to do experiments like that. Let me move on to dense clouds. We want to understand the pathway from life on Earth, sorry, from atoms in space to life on Earth. You folks have already seen this dark molecular cloud. Not this one, but others give birth to stars and planets that form around them. When these planets form, they are covered by a magma ocean, liquid rock. Organic molecules do not survive under those conditions. So one of the mechanisms that has been proposed for seeding the chemicals needed for life is that meteorites and comets may have delivered those from the remnants of the molecular cloud to the planets that, that form. So how far did astrochemistry take us on this pathway towards life as we know? This cloud's half a lot year in size, just to give you a sense of scale. You've seen that the interstellar medium is rich in chemicals. Over 200 molecules have been seen. This is an incomplete list. I think Mike showed a much more updated up-to-date list. I can't remember, maybe Suzanne also showed a list of chemicals. <clears throat> I forget. Um, three quarters of these contain atomic carbon, and I highlight those in green. What that means is that interstellar chemistry is organic chemistry. So I hope you guys remember your origo. There's water there, too, and I highlight in blue the molecules that are involved in the formation process. So what are some of the gas phase pathways that are necessary to form the chemicals needed for life? These are dense molecular clouds. Ooh, 10 to the 4 particles per centimeter cubed. Dense. Anyway, they're called dense for historical reasons. So again, binary reactions drive the chemistry. The temperature is 10 Kelvin. So again, neutral neutral reactions usually don't go forward at such low temperatures. It's ion neutral chemistry that drives the gas phase. These clouds are primarily H2. A cosmic ray will ionize the H2, as John described yesterday, giving us H2+. H2 plus reacts on the time scale of a day or so with an H2 molecule to make H3+. Plus. That H3 plus likes to give up its proton, and it can react with carbon to make CH plus or CH2 single charge. This is one of the first, I apologize, organic molecules. Carbon has been bound up into a molecular form. It can go on to react with hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in atomic or molecular form, and it can lead to the formation of carboxyl molecules, cyano, and amino. This is a highly simplified chain of chemical reactions. What my group has done 
is we focused on this early link in this chain of chemical reactions, looking at carbon reacting phase three. There's also atomic oxygen in clouds, so we can get the H3 plus reacting with the O. That gives us OH plus or H2O plus. That can react with H2 and electrons and sequentially lead to the formation of water. I should say that water is believed to form primarily on surfaces. Uh, gas phase chemistry is not fast enough to explain the observed abundances of water. I should also add that H2 formation in the modern universe happens on grain surfaces because that's much faster than the gas phase reaction process that I talked about on Tuesday. We've also measured this link, oxygen with H3+. Plus. So just to give you a sense of what was out there before we started our project, this is the rate coefficient as a function of temperature. I don't like to say rate constant because it's not constant versus temperature. It varies with temperature, so I prefer rate coefficient. I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, this is the temperature range that's relevant for molecular clouds, 10 to 300 Kelvin. This horizontal line is the Langevin rate coefficient. It's a classical calculation that takes into account the centrifugal barrier that forms when the two particles pass one another. And um, it's constant with temperature. These are two semi-classical calculations. They take a quantum mechanical potential energy surface and they run classical trajectories on that surface. They differ by a factor of two because the quantum mechanical calculations differ. I want to emphasize that this four atom reactor scattering system is beyond current computational capabilities. We are in 2020. It's 95 years since quantum mechanics was invented. It's how many years since the computer was invented? 75 maybe, 70. And the challenge of keeping track of all of the uh, parameters necessary to accurately model this system quantum mechanically is just beyond current computational capabilities. There's one laboratory measurement for carbon on H3+. They trap H3+, and it'll await an RF trap, and they float atomic carbon into the trap, and they measure the formation of CH+, and CH2+, as a function of time, it's a pseudo first order uh, reaction process, and so they can back out of the rate coefficient. But it's at a temperature of 1,000 degrees. So there are no lab data at molecular cloud temperatures. And we don't know if we're up here, if we're down here, if there's a steep temperature dependence. We have a large uncertainty in the rate coefficient for this reaction. And that has significant astrochemical which I'll come to after I talk about the measurement. This is the apparatus that we built to study this process, neutral atoms, X, reacting with H3+. We submitted the proposal in 2007. We got rejected. We submitted it to the NSF Division of Astronomical Sciences Advanced Technology and Instrumentation Program, which is a program that only funds things that slap onto the back end of the telescope to this doesn't slap on the back of the telescope. This is in a basement lab with no windows. So we got rejected. We submitted again in 2008. We revised it. Who knows what happened in 2008? The economy tanked. Stimulus funding. This got funded because the program manager had more money than usual and was able to go deeper into the selection pool than typical. This is proof that if you don't buy a lottery ticket, you can't win the lottery. So, we have a source here that we use to make anions. 
We extract the anions and we deflect it 90 degrees to prevent anything from the source getting into the interaction region. The beam, so to speak, and measure the higher frequency lines once we have something. But initially, it's not that we just dilute the population more any more than we have the number of bubbles. Um, the other technique, which I won't talk about today, but I'll talk about tomorrow, is chirp pulse spectroscopy. This was developed about a decade ago by Brooks Pate. And this is uh, something that's a very remarkable technique. Well, now we're not doing tiny frequency steps with a cavity. We're doing broadband. What? Oh, there was a question. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I just had yes. to ask again. Um, how do you warm up the beam, so to speak? Yes. Um, you can use things like different buffer gases, for example, uh, that's, that's one common method. Um, I mean, there are various tricks, so to speak. I mean, part of it is you can also sample, you know, you, you could potentially sample the molecular beam um, closer to its orbit, so to speak. Instead of looking, you know, many, many nozzle diameters, you could look at it closer at it. So different things you can do uh, to try to um, extend this microscopy. The, the other way to do it is just to use a completely different experiment where maybe the rotational that you do Instead of two Kelvin, it's, it's liquid helium cool cell at 80 Kelvin. So, what's the danger of changing the chemistry though when you change the vacuum gas? Changing? Oh, um, well, I, no, the point is you have, if, if you've gotten to the point where you know you found something, then you can sit on the line and you can change parameters, or you can, let's say, go to a line that's fairly high in energy that's weak, and then adjust parameters to see by, if I try to discharge voltage up, for example. Would the line get stronger? If I replace the buffer gas, which is neon, with helium, would it be even stronger? Right? So there are different things like that that you can do. Um, so this is an amazing uh, capability where, again, what we're doing now is we're taking, we're piggy banking on all these developments in related fields, high speed digital communications, um, and in particular. And what we do is all we, we can buy now a, a Money, you can buy these arbitrary waveform generators that are incredibly powerful. You can go at a 60, we have a 65 gigasample sample per second arbitrary waveform generator in our lab. So you can synthesize essentially a wide variety of these chirps. You can then um, ultimately use a small radar and amplify this radiation. So we have a chirp, we go from, this, for example, 0 to 10 gigahertz in one microsecond. And you run it through this radar, which is just a very, very powerful amplifier. And it will amplify the function of SF instantaneously, this chirp of time. And then we blast it into our cell and we perform this chirp experiment. We turn the, the, the excitation off, and then we have a very, very fast digitizer. Again, um, depending on who you are, if you're the military, you can probably afford to get 100, 100 giga sample per second. Uh, um, <coughs> scope, so you directly digitize the output. And so you get incredible bandwidth. You get 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, all at once. Now, you don't have the advantage of the sensitivity of the cavity, but when you exchange sensitivity, you get the bandwidth. All right, so you get this incredibly wide perspective. We'll I'll talk about that more uh, tomorrow. But, so in our case, and in, in other people's case, what we do is we take this for a transform cavity experiment, which is a simplified is shown here. We don't use, we use the supersonic electrical beam, but what we're now going to do is we're going to apply electrical discharge to it. Right. And by doing so, we then will inject gas. Now, this is a very low repetition rate experiment because uh, we're limited by the size of the diffusion pump. We have a fairly big diffusion pump. Um, I should point out, everything in Fourier transform microspectroscopy scales on size. So you can, there are people out there, Steve Kuglich, who's now retired in Arizona, he had a spectrometer that went down to, I think, one gigahertz. And he had, you know, cavity mirrors that were like three feet in diameter, right? So everything scales. One to low frequency, you make the mirrors bigger. If you want to go to higher repetition rate, you get a bigger diffusion pump, right? Ours is 8,000 meters per second. You could buy a 100,000 meters per second diffusion pump, right? You have to figure out where to put it. But it's huge. But you can do all this, all this scale. So nevertheless, we are limited. 8,000 meters per second diffusion pump will limit to about five hertz. So the duty cycle of this experiment is actually really low. Right? We're doing five times a second, we're doing a measurement for one millisecond. So we're doing five milliseconds out of 1,000 milliseconds. Right? 
Okay? But nevertheless, while we're picking, we have a uh, very good sensitivity during that period of time. The point here is we, the gas will then rush down here. It's a dilute sample of organic vapor. And then we have a self lightning and self extinguishing discharge. Once the density gets high enough, the voltage is high enough, the discharge will strike. All right? And in this throw, we get all these collisions. We break chemical bonds. And we ultimately reform new molecules or we form reactive intermediates. And so by the time it gets here, we could produce molecules which are much bigger than the precursors we started with. So, for example, the example I showed the other day was we, looked, we could take something like sinus 7 8 c 3 m and dive 7 8 c 4 h and we can make 8 c 17 m right? So we can make these really big molecules in the throat of the expansion. Uh, again, there are many things to optimize in terms of the gas concentrations, the voltage, the geometry of here, but you can produce this very rich broth of both familiar and exotic molecules, many which are uh, larger than what we're seeing. Or I mean, that we started with, I'm sorry. All right, so there are lots of different ways to then begin the process of figuring out if I have a specific molecule I'm looking for, how do I know that it's there? You can do things like chemical assays, right? So if I know the molecule is case I'll show you is silicon and carbon. Um, if I take a precursor, it shouldn't depend upon whether hydrogen is present or if I replace hydrogen with deuterium. All right, that specific species. Is it an open shell molecule? If it is, then if I apply a magnetic field, then the line shouldn't be affected by that. Uh, it certainly should be a discharge line if it's going to be something reactive. I can rule out larger molecules by assuming that I mistakenly, if I see two lines, Saying, well, maybe instead of it's the one, uh, J equal two to one and three to two, it's you know four to five and five to six, right? So there are different ways to look for this. There are, in some cases, ways that you can distinguish because there can be hyperfine structure. Again, we have very high resolution, so we can use that to our advantage to so look for things. For example, does a molecule contain nitrogen? Um, we use a and we have a very powerful method is double resonance, whereby we can link lines together in spectrum. All right, so ab-initio calculations are a key part of what we do, um, or like collaboration. But again, the idea here is that you can, fairly standard programs, normally predict the rotational spectrum to typically a percent or so. Right, it could be better, uh, it could be worse. Um, and with fairly standard programs, as, as this row teaches yesterday, um, and using fairly standard um, desktop machines, you can provide What's most important, obviously, is the structure, the rotational constants, and what's often overlooked sometimes is the dipole moments, and specifically the projection of the dipole moments. So a molecule might have a very big dipole moment, but if it's a rotational spectrum, or it's, it's a rotational moment is very small, we'd like to know that in advance, because the amount of power we use in the experiment depends upon this quantity. And we can, obviously, the calculations can show us the relative stability as well. So typically, you get a few percent. If you go to really high-level cluster calculations, Throw the kitchen sink at it, depending on the species, you can get down to a tenth of a percent. Keep in mind that what we need for astronomical search is much, much more accurate. Right? But the point here is a cavity device, if you told me the rotational spectrum of the molecule is, a calculation is a tenth of a percent. At 10 gigahertz, that's 10 megahertz. The cavity has a IF analog, it's has been with a half a megahertz. So that's that's 20 settings of the cavity. I can do 20 seconds of cavity in five minutes, right? So, and then if I can find the line, then all of a sudden that 10 megahertz uncertainty is now a few kilohertz uncertainty, right? So that's exactly what we're seeking to do. We use this kind of bootstrapping method to ultimately find. I will warn you, however, that you almost always get an answer when you do have an issue right? And you have to be careful that the answer is actually meaningful. So I will, I changed my clock 20 minutes before I started, so I, I actually reduced the amount of information. Um, so there's two basic approaches. The one that is very widely used today uh, is that you have an idea of a species you seek to detect. Right? So what we're going to do now, we have an abomination calculation of the molecule. It's very narrowly focused. And we're going to, generally speaking, ignore all other lines in the spectrum if they don't meet the criteria of the molecule that we're seeking, even if they're strong. Because, again, we have a model that we're trying to find the rotational transition that fits that model. Um, but I'll talk about wide band spectroscopy, where, in fact, we're going to just measure everything and then 
try to figure it all out. All right, so the idea is that we have this iterative cycle. We optimize, again, nearly all searches are done this way. We optimize the chemistry on, in hopes that we will uh, produce the molecule that we seek in high abundance. Typically, we use analogic reasoning, which is the weakest form of reasoning, right? By adding, well, if we're making C4H radical, we optimize this chemistry, we want to make C6H radical. That's probably a pretty good step starting questions, right? So we use different things which we think are related to the species that we seek. Do a search based on the calculations. We detect lines. We try to assign in the spectrum that we measure of everything that we can. Is the line, the main lines, do they have some unique structure that might tell us about the carriers? We need to test the remaining lines using the most, most important descriptive first. For example, if it's a magnetic molecule, we want to look, look at all the lines and see which ones are magnetic, right? We can do isotopics. Then we're going to take, do related measurements. And the key point, repeat this, and the key point at some point, fairly quickly, the model should be predicted, right? We should be able to base this on a small number of model. Uh, measurements to ultimately use a simple rotation of the and predict even more lines, very accurately. And the key point here is confirmation then becomes detection of a rare uh, isotopic species if necessary. Again, many in this process, we're throwing out lots and lots of lines that don't be able all right, so let me just show you now about, as a, as a specific example, about SICSI. It took out there's three reasons why we would be interested in this, only one of which is astronomical. The first one is it's thought to be fundamentally important. It's the only uh, cluster of silicon carbide three atoms that whose structure and bonding has not been measured uh, pre previously as a limited laboratory detection. It's, thought, it's well known to be highly stable. In, 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 in the, as, a, as a product in evaporation of solid and silicon carbide. And as I'll show you, chemical equilibrium calculations have also all predicted to be very abundant in IRC plus in And, excuse me, the point I think of Daniel yesterday about the role that it may play in silicon carbide uh, dust formation. Okay. So I won't go into this because it's really not the focus here, but these are the four molecules C3, SIC2, SI3, and SI, these are all well known. This is the um, SIC2, which is very prominent in space. It was actually um, long thought to have a different geometry. That was thought to have SI, a linear molecule, SIC, C, um, Rick Smalley. The last measurement he did for C60 was to show, in fact, that the prevailing view of its structure was wrong and it had this T shaped structure. Right? Half the levels were missing, it has to be symmetry, and the path that is the people who found this molecule in space. But it's a very fascinating chemical system because it's SI CSI is actually very like C3, it's got this very low frequency bending. So as you begin to bend this molecule, you get this um, interesting effects in terms of how the vibration pattern changes. Alright? It's been known, I don't even I think this I think the reference, the date on here, I think this is 1950. People have shown years and years ago that if you just heat up metal, silicon carbide metal, it'd be hard to read here. But one of the, the two most abundant polycomic molecules that come off are SIC2, the aforementioned molecule. I should point out SIC2 is the carrier of the narrow Sanford bands in the spectrum of stars, so it's also optically very well known. And the molecule we're seeking, SI, SICSI. And finally, people have long calculated this species to be a very important, a very abundant near the polar sphere of the source IRC plus 16. This is from 1992. And this is a, again, a, a model um, that comes into look at the silicon chemistry near the photosphere. We know, in fact, that the of these HGBT stars, as Lucy mentioned, are one of the two major sources for interstellar dust grains. We know, in fact, that still macroscopic points of silicon carbide uh, are fairly observed fairly close to the star itself. We know this is a characteristic emission in the infrared, which is thought to be to these. So SIS is well known in, in the source of the you mentioned that SIO is, SIC2 is. Um, and you see here, at least by this prediction, it's one of the most abundant small molecules in the focus of the star. Me. Okay. There's another calculation shown here. Uh, this is now again looking at the height of the temperature and, uh, as a function of different species. This is the relative abundance. And you see near at, at low temperatures, 
thousand tweets or so, SI, CSI is one of the most important small numbers. Okay, but in spectrum, vocational spectrum has been known. Again, just uh, maybe uh, reinforcing what Lucy said yesterday, there's about five sources that people in the field constantly go back to, in part because, again, the telescope time is competitive, so you want to go ultimately look at a source where you think you have to find this molecule. Half of the molecules observed in space are observed in IRC. All right, roughly half. All right, it's, again, it's, it produces, it's a diamond star, it's a central star, CW Leo, which is expelling a tremendous amount of gas and dust. Most of the heavier elements are produced in triple alpha processes. Um, in this uh, source and other ones, it's the brightest object in the infrared. It's a carbon rich star, and we can actually do incredible time dependent chemistry because it's sufficiently close to us. Okay, and all sorts of metal, metal bearing design ions, carbon chains, and mega lines and other things. So, this is a, a spectrum, um, if you will, a time elapsed spectrum of IRC. So, what I'm just doing here is the same spectrum, but it's blowing it up, right? And another way to think about this is if you show it as a function of time, the top would be kind of the spectrum you would see in 1975, you'd be dominated by the very strong with, again, better telescopes, more sensitive instrumentation. What was a simple spectrum 30 or 40 years ago is now, it's not confusion limited, but it's incredibly rich. Right. What's amazing about this source is that you can, it's close enough you can do, use powerful components. All right, and what we know is that much of this rich chemistry of these radicals and ions occurs in this outer surface shell, shell of gas and dust. But we know much closer in that we get macroscopic frame formation. Right? So this at the bottom is the log pond. So we know we have dust nucleation, dust growth, dust growth, and ultimately photochemistry out here. So this is a log plot, right? So we go from we're going from 10 to the 15th down to you know a few hundred um, particles per cubic centimeter, the temperature drops to 3,000 degrees to 20 degrees. So a tremendous amount is happening in this inner region. And in the Plateau Riviera, the SMA interferometers, um, we can very crudely understand this spatial structure, right? And so we can map out like, many molecules over here, and very small number of molecules are closer to the central star. From Alma, a picture then becomes this, right? So that the ultimate resolution of Alma as applied to IRC will allow us really to understand, live like an onion, we can look at the change in the chemistry radially from the central star. And we can potentially really understand dust nucleation and dust growth because this process occurs much, much closer before we get the terminal loss. All right, so as an example, this is just data where we compare um, the single uh, single dish IRAM 30 meter and all my cycle zero. I'm not sure why that's um, showing up. All right, so it's, it's, you can see it better on these displays, but there's red and there's black. So red is the, is the single dish data and black is the IRAM, I'm sorry, the ALMA data at 0.6 arc second resolution. And you can see, it allows us that we're not looking at the outer surface shell, shell. We're looking here how close to the central surface. So things that are very prominent in the outer shell, like this radical, are not observed closely to that. Meanwhile, you see all these lines, and this has a double piece collection. Again, this is the Doppler effect. We're in the outer shell, it's expanding out. Most of the lines, in fact, are U. U means unidentified. And they have a single, uh, a very simple line shape, meaning they're really close to the center star. We don't know what all these new lines are, right? And, and there are lots of them, right? But we do know that we have all these small stable molecules here, so like SIO, HCN, we can see HCN up to 10,000 of these location. Yes, I guess it can, et cetera, et cetera. So we, the question is how, in fact, the key question is how is this nucleation process? That's where SI and CSI is thought to be important. How am I doing for time? Oh, that's okay. no, I got to speed up. Um, anyhow, so there's been a lot of work on this system. Again, light, SI, C2. People originally thought it might be linear. It turns out not to be. The consensus is now that it has a C2B type structure. It's a shallow bending uh, potential. Structure with a modest eye at the moment. We looked for it in the optical and seen it now. Our group has John Meyer and it has been observed in the infrared. So, 
how are we going to detect this? It turns out it's deceptively hard, it's deceptively difficult in the sense that it has very low, very few low frequency transitions. All right, so this has CQB symmetry. We have both two bosons, so half the levels are missing. It's got a, again, it's just bad, so the transitions that we're seeing are B type transitions, so it depends upon the sample. So at 2 Kelvin, uh, our spectrometer, unlike Lucy's, doesn't go to 80 gigahertz, it goes to 40 gigahertz. And so if we, or 90, sorry. Uh, these are the predicted lines between 5 and 50 gigahertz, assuming 2 Kelvin rotational temperature. So the very faint lines, a really strong line that we like to detect is this one here at 45 gigahertz. Um, it's challenging, as I already mentioned, because its low J spectrum is very sparse at low frequency. We have CGP symmetry in the shell and everything. There's a couple factors that really have to be considered. First of all, if you change the angle by one degree, one degree, you shift the spectrum by two gigahertz. So keep in mind, again, the cavity has an instantaneous bandwidth of 0.5 megahertz. Right? So you have to, it's desirable to know this bending angle to ideally a degree or better. That's a, this is an example of just how much the spectrum would shift by one degree. Second, which we haven't talked about, is zero point correction. That is, calculations normally are uh, zero point calculations determine the equilibrium of rotational constants of the molecule. Experimentally, we're measuring the vibration of the average. So, zero point vibration is an important correction. And in this case, it also shifts the spectrum by two to three gigahertz. All right? So, we need to account for that as well in this calculation. So the strongest line here is at 42, which is just above the frequency range of the device. I won't go into it, but another technical challenge that Lucy mentioned is that SSI lane, which is really an ideal source of silicon atoms that can be used for this experiment, at high, um, uh, high concentrations of pyrophore. Right? That means it burns in there. Yeah, but I'm about to ask, how are you making this? Like, how would you think? I'm going to tell you in a moment. But the okay. beauty is that um, and that's why, in fact, like in Japan, in academic laboratories, you can't use silent. It's like some of the worst industrial accidents that involve silent. If, it, if, you, if you have a high concentration of silane and you leave the tank open, you're gone. I mean, it will explode, right? But, the, but as I'll show you, in our experiments, we have highly diluted samples. And it turns out, well, it depends upon the movement of buffer gas. But if you buy, for example, silane and neon, silane and argon, below about a percent, it's, it's not pyrophoric at all. It's just considered essentially just like any other air gas. And in our experiments, we're typically using in the experiment a tenth of a percent. So we can get away with we can get away with actually buying a golden sample, which is not at all dangerous. So this is the spectrum, all right, that we have access to. So we can't look for this line. So what do we do? Any ideas? What would you do? Okay, the answer is, you cheat. Right? No, the answer is, essentially all, um, the most abundant species, or isotopic species, are always heavier than the normal isotopic species. So what you do is, first, you don't do the normal first, you carbon 30. Everything is heavier, so it's going to shift the spectrum down. It shifts it down about 10%. So instead of 42, it's a 38, that transition. All right? And, Therefore, we can then, oops, well, ultimately, the transition that we're going to seek to find is at 38 gigahertz, which is well within the range of our device. So that's what we do. So we optimize the chemistry. We use the silane, and in this case, we can buy or could buy doubly substituted uh, isotopic acetylene. So we actually then have to measure, which wasn't known, which is trivial to do, but we measure the rotational lines of the doubly substituted SICG, which is spectrum. Well, we optimize the chemistry to produce that line in high abundance, hoping that it's going to produce SICSI in high abundance. Right? And we do a search. I don't have much faith in our theory, friends. So instead of, you know, I literally, we just scan like two gigahertz, right, to cover everything. And these are the lines that we observe, right? And it turns out some of them are known. SIO is very, you get oxygen in these experiments very easily. So you can form these SIO molecule and it's Highly vibrational exciting, as I've shown here. The strongest line, which we could not assign at the time, um, is indicated here. Right? And the initial prediction is here. So we can do now we can look at every line that's not assigned, 
And we can begin to do tests. For example, the model that we're seeking doesn't contain hydrogen, right? So if I replace silane with deuterium silane, which you can buy commercially, the lines should still be present, right? If the line changes, then if the line disappears, that means it contains hydrogen. Uh, it should depend upon both precursors. I can pull one precursor out and the other. If the line still persists, like in the case of SI3, you can move it out. It should be non-magnetic. It should be discharged. So then the question is, it's a question for the students, how many lines do you need? How many individual rotation lines do you need to be certain for an, 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 an identification? So a show of hands, everyone think it's five or more. No one's raising their hand. How many think it's three or more? How many think it's one? The answer is, not a student, but in the back. The answer actually is slightly cheating, it's one. And the reason you can do this is because you may not know the rotational spectrum, but you can be a very confident identification because you can do isotopic spectroscopy. This line is really strong, right? So silicon has the advantage it has two isotopic species, silicon 29 and silicon 30, right? At 4.7% and 3.1%. This is strong enough. If this is the correct identification, I, have, I can have a theoretical calculation of the structure. I can correct that theoretical calculation. I can scale it to the measurement that I have here. And then I can say, well, what happens if I replace one of the silicon atoms, 28 or 29? I can predict the isotopic shape. And I have enough sensitivity to detect it. Right? So I can then optimize the chemistry of this line. And if this is right, then within a reasonably good uh, accuracy, I should be able to find another line down by that ratio of intensities, which is silicon 29, and ultimately silicon. Technically, you do two experiments. No, it's the same line. <laughs> it's the same line. It's the same rotational line, right? But it's a different isotopic species. Two lines. Right? And so that's what you can, and, and the beauty of the isotopic ship, especially, it's not a hydrogen, so it's very, it's a heavy atom. You can, you can um, predict the isotopic shift to 1%. So if the line is supposed to be shifted by 100 megahertz, that line should fall within 90 you know, within plus or minus one metric. So it's actually a very precise prediction. And so that's what you can do. And there's another advantage of doing this. The silicon 29 has a spin of a half. We're doing high resolution spectroscopy. So in fact, the line that we observe at exactly the right spot, shifted the frequency, has this additional, okay, this, this is the Doppler effect of the instrument of the experiment. And you see it's this 10 seconds integration. You can barely see the frequency, right? And this is silicon 29, which we search for on, the, on that basis. And it has this extra splitting here. And this extra splitting drives because it's nuclear spin rotation. In fact, it's like it has a spin on half, which we can resolve. This is, this is the end of the location, um, how it interacts with this very small magnetic field of silicon. So that was very encouraging. We then became a silicon 30, and then we optimized the chemistry and then ultimately found more lines. And we did isotopic spectroscopy with those lines. So really, after three or four lines, we have now the rotational transitions. Yes? So I wish to point out at higher frequencies where you don't have a beautiful FT spectrometer with high sensitivity, you cannot see isotopic logs in natural abundance, and therefore this trick does not work. <laughs> but, but you could do isotopic. You can buy. You can buy samples of yes, isotopic yes. substitutions. We, we did look into buying all silicon twenty nine uh, silicon. Yeah, it was about seventy five thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that actually is. I, I digress. But that well, how much? Actually, what's that? For how much? Uh, it was a small tank, so it would have it would have run probably you know it's it's hard to say depends on the consumption, but maybe a year of uh, use. But it compared it's nothing compared to to uh, sulfur thirty three, which we wanted to do. An um, unnamed company sent us a quote by fax for four hundred fifty thousand dollars for uh, hundred milligrams. <laughs> and, um, we didn't we didn't buy it. That would have been the entire answer. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, I'm now really going to get it. But so the, ultimately, we measured a number of transitions um, under these conditions. Now we measured the carbon 13. We haven't measured them all, right? But again, by the scaling argument, we can scale now, um, and we can now predict the rotational transitions of the normal fairly accurately. We can then replace carbon 13 with carbon 12. We can do that experiment. And what we found, which was crucially important, is initially we did. The, Measurements, the range of the device, we can do double resonance experiments and extend the spectroscopy further. And it turns out, a key point here is in fact, rotational temperature is 
not to increase. It's actually much higher in this experiment, probably because SIC2 is just not location of the cooling particle. So we could see transitions that were something like 85 calories. Right? So these are all the transitions. What is the type of, or is there H3 plus chemistry happening in a solar system? And how is that? On planets. The Jupiter has been observed extensively in H3 plus, and the other gas giants have also. They use it to determine the properties of the atmospheres of those planets. Any other questions from the students? Yes? Great, you guys know where to find me. Thank you.